Maranatha Cry. And the title of this sermon is Even So Reclaiming the Maranatha Cry. And I have to tell you, this is another one of those interesting um, examples of synchronicity. Because at men's Bible study, you know, a couple of our men started talking about how we should really be yearning for the return of Jesus. And I couldn't help but think, well, wow, that's the next sermon. And that often happens. And I think sometimes there's just a, there's that unspoken kind of synchronistic thoughts among believers. So it's always encouraging to hear. Now, at the end of his first epistle to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul used the word Maranatha or Maranatha, however you want to pronounce it, which is Aramaic for, O Lord, come. It's Aramaic for, O Lord, come. This is the Maranatha cry, a deep longing to see the second coming of Jesus. For too many in the body, I believe that cry that was almost certainly yelled, that cry has become a whimper. So let's call out to the Lord for his return and let's restore within ourselves that desire to see him return, thereby reclaiming the Maranatha cry. Let's begin at the end, shall we? At the end of our Bible. I want to look at Revelation 22, 12 through 17, and then I'll read verse 20. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to use these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now you see, the Lord says he's coming quickly. What's the idea here? Because, I don't know about you, 2,000 years is not very quick to me. Right? So what's happening in this passage? He's saying he's coming quickly. Well, contextually meaning he's right at the door. He could come very suddenly, surprisingly, unexpectedly, so to speak. And so he's available to come. So anyone reading this text should live in that reality that in our lives, he could return. And he will return in one generation. Very well could be ours. And so the idea that he's coming quickly, it's telling us as the reader, we should have a sense of expectancy in our lives that our great king could return. Because like I said, it's going to happen in one generation. And, um, you know, it's like when Paul says that one generation will not die. There'll be a generation of believers that will never die because Jesus will return in that generation. And I got to tell you, I'm trying to hold out. Um, my ankle hurts and my knee hurts. So it's like signs of getting older, but I'm, I'm trying to make it. But there is a great expectancy. It could happen. I know the bodies break down. I know that the moment, if you're a believer, you die, you go to be with the Lord. I'm quite confident in that, so I'm not worried about it. But at the same time, there is a reality that there will be a generation that will be alive. There'll be a generation of the church that when Jesus returns. There'll be a generation of believers, people that know him. Now, notice that he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. God is speaking. And it is he who returns. So let's not miss that Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Why does this matter? Because this is one of the many, many, many ways in which we know that Jesus is the great creator God. He is Yahweh. He is not a God that was created later. It's just another way that we are told who he is. He is, and he says this, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We read that in Revelation 1.8. It's the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
This phrase, who is and who was and who is to come, this is a Greek way of saying, I am that I am. It's the same concept, but it's just taking that idea, placing it in this Greek language. And so Jesus is the great creator, and he's coming again as the man, God, Messiah, Jesus Christ. So, say the beginning of Revelation mentions this. So you're supposed to start reading the book with this in mind. You're going to read all this trouble that's going to happen when you read Revelation. But he begins the book by telling you who he is, that he's coming. And then the book ends by him assuring you, but I'm coming. And so that's where a great hope lies. So don't worry about the trouble you're reading about. Don't worry about that. The reality is that you can trust in Jesus returning. Now you see this city being discussed in our reading, but of course that's the New Jerusalem. It's the ultimate hope. Now why is New Jerusalem the ultimate hope? It's a city, right, that comes down out of heaven after the millennium. It's the eternal state where all believers will live with God forever. So that's why it's the ultimate hope. It's not that we're placing our hope in the city itself. It's the reality that it describes where we will live with Jesus for eternity. And so that is why it is our great hope. It's something we're supposed to look forward to because it is where we are all going to end up. And we're all going to be living there with each other forever, all of us who love Jesus. So if you don't get along with each other, just sorry. You're going to be living with each other forever, so might as well start now and try to get along. And so it's to Jesus we should be saying come because we're showing fidelity in the reality that this will happen, that this is God's plan. So if we're asking him to come and saying, please, Lord Jesus, come, he can start to bring about these things and bring his kingdom and we can start to dwell with him. So that should be our great desire. You'll see, you might have noticed that I use two different Bible versions here. I use the New American Standard Bible for most of these passages at the end of Revelation. But I chose the King James Version for verse 20. Here's why. The Greek word nigh and the manuscript family the King James um, Bible comes from, well, it, it exists in that manuscript family. It's, there's a family of manuscripts that the King James is translated from that has that word. And that's where we get the phrase, even so, from. And so if you have another translation that doesn't use that manuscript family, you may not see this phrase, even so. Now, it's not in almost any modern Bible because they don't use those manuscript families. For various reasons, I suspect that the word nigh was in the original Greek. I actually think that probably reflects the original uh, rendering of Revelation. Now, Revelation, the, the Greek is really weird in Revelation. If you've ever studied it, it's, it's strange. So it's, it's tough to understand. But its translation as even so fits the overall tone, and it sort of fits the grammatical structure of how the sentences lead to this point in 20. Fits the overall tone and the passage. It fits the context. The idea is this. Jesus is promising that he's coming, Right? He has said this in many, many ways. I am coming. The Alpha and the Omega is coming. The Almighty is coming. It's certain. And then there's a response to what he says, right? And this is one of the reasons I'm almost, I really believe even so, nigh is in the Greek. Because the response is, he's saying, I'm coming. And we're supposed to stand there and say, even so, we would like to say, please come quickly. In other words, even though you have promised your coming, nothing can change the second coming. Nothing can stop or prevent Jesus returning. But nevertheless, it's God's people. So a natural response is God's people. We can say, well, he said he's coming, so that's all there is to it. But yet, because we want him to come, we recognize the fact that he's coming. We are, even so, even with the reality that you're coming, I would like to say the following. Please come quickly. I would like you to come. I invite you to this place. I desire for you to come. It's more than just an intellectual assent to knowledge that you are coming. It's that I want you to. So it's a response. So it's like saying, even so, please come. I recognize what you do. Now I'm asking you to come, even though you already said you would. Because that shows I really want you to come. We, the church, are the bride of Christ. We're purchased with his blood. And so that's... The context in which we're saying this, we're saying it like a bride who's awaiting for her betrothed to come and get her. 
And we see this relationship of the body of Christ with Jesus. We see how that our relationship is supposed to be understood according to this, being a bride of Christ. Now, some of you men, you might go, bride of Christ, I never really cared to be called that. You know, it's a little odd for me to say I'm the bride of Christ or I'm in the bride of Christ. I hear you, but we're going to have to get over it because that's what connects us to Jesus. And it's meant to describe a relationship, so don't read into it too much. Don't get uncomfortable with it. You're, it it's important to be part of his bride. Let's look at John 14, 1 through 4, and I think this will help us understand what's happening here and how important it is to be the bride of Christ. This is John 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. I'll make a quick point on verse 1. Notice that he says, believe in God, believe also in me. This is his way to say, it's rhetorically like saying this. You say you believe in God, you trust in God, then therefore you should trust in me. What's the logical connection? Because I am God. So if you really trust in him, you really believe in him, believe in me if you want to be consistent because he is God. Now, then he talks about his, in his father's house are many dwelling places. Ah, but Jesus is leaving for a while, and then he's coming back. He's going to his father's house in heaven, but then he's returning at some point for his bride, right? So what's happening? Well, Jesus is using language in reference to a typical Jewish wedding in the Galilee region. So let's remember his audience here. They would have understood the context of what he's saying. So in short, I won't get into the details. This is how a Jewish wedding around the Galilee region especially would work. You would get engaged to a woman, and it was more serious than engagement in our culture. You know, we can get engaged in our culture, and then you could go, you know what, forget it. You could get mad and just break it off, right? Nothing happens. You get engaged in first century Jewish culture, that's half married. I mean, it's serious. You have a uh, you have a ceremony where you're brought into the engagement. You can't just break that. It's very difficult. Something serious has to happen. So what the man would do is he would get engaged, but, and, and then he knows he's going to be married, but you know what? He can't just take his wife off because in that culture, you know what you often did? You often would leave, so the man would get engaged. He would go to his parents' home, and he would often build a house right next to his parents' Or even more commonly, he would build onto his parents' home because that's typically how families lived then. So he would build an addition to his parents' house, and when he was done, he would make everything right and make everything great for his future bride. And then when he was finished, he would come at an unknown hour to get her. And you know what? He would have a party with him, a wedding party, and they would blow shofars when they were outside of her home. And it could be any time, and she didn't know, and it was supposed to be a surprise. And he, they'd blow the chauffeur, she'd go, oh my goodness, my husband has arrived. And he, the husband would come with the party and take her away at an hour she didn't know, without warning, and take her to the home that had been prepared for her, the place where her husband had gone. And so this idea that you would go to your parents' home, the man would, and build an addition to his home, you know, when I think about that, I think, you know what, I could have been a first century Jew because you build the addition on to your home when you're the man. See, if it would have been your future, if it would have been like your parents-in-law's home, forget it. This would have been an outrageous problem. But, you know, just giving my wife a hard time. But this is a special thing. Think about the picture of what's happening here, right? In other words, Jesus is saying this, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to, my father's home has many mansions, my father's mansion has got all these many rooms. In other words, there's many houses within houses within houses. And I'm going to build an addition for all of my people. And where I'm going, don't worry, I'm going to come back and get you as my bride. And I'm going to do a cry 
There's going to be this great shout. There's going to be these trumpets. We see this right in 1 Thessalonians 4. We see the trump of the archangel, the shout of God. The idea is his party, his wedding party, he's going to have an archangel blow the shofar, blow a trumpet. He's going to, with a shout of command, he's going to arrive and pick up his bride. By the way, just as an aside, this is why I can't perceive how we could, however you want to place 1 Thessalonians um, 4 and the rapture, however you want to understand that pre-trib, sometime during the tribulation, it's because of John 14 is one of the reasons I can't see why it's second coming. Because Jesus went to heaven. So therefore, this has to be fulfilled. It can't be fulfilled the second coming because he sets up his kingdom on earth. There has to be some point in which he comes to take his bride to his home. To, to have the wedding ceremony because you fulfill the ceremony once you come get your bride and this certainly seems to fit with that but the idea though for our, our purposes this morning especially I want us to focus on as the bride we should desire to be with our betrothed as soon as possible now this might surprise you it's hard for me to put myself in the mind of a young woman expecting her husband to come it's tough. I, it's hard to project that. But I have to think if I really loved my betrothed and I was awaiting for my husband to come. And I'm a first century Jewish woman. Again, even as I say this, I know how silly it is. But I have to think I'd be excited, right, that my husband is coming to get me at some unknown hour. He could arrive any time. When am I going to hear the trumpet call? That's the same sort of excitement we should feel for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he could come at any moment. May very well be in your lifetime. Don't be too surprised. Now, I've spent some, a good amount of time in my ministry in nursing homes. And, you know, I have some people, they'll tell me, I thought Jesus would come back in my lifetime. But it looks like no, because I'm in my late, not my late 90s. And, and I, I tell them, you never know. Don't. He could come at any moment. So don't give up that hope. But regardless, we'll see him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. So now we're seeing the greater context of where we see this word Maranatha. Now, like I noted before, Maranatha, it's an Aramaic word. And it's transliterated here into Greek letters instead of being translated into its meaning. So we're actually left in the text. They're giving us the Aramaic word, but in Greek letters. They're not translating it for us. Now, it likely means, in fact, when I say likely, look, it means, oh, Lord, come. And you should put an exclamation mark with it. But because I want to be a reasonable academic pastor, I should let you know, some earlier scholars have said that it meant the Lord has come. They go, oh, the Lord come, as if it was some past recognition that Jesus had come. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. I'm almost certain, in context, the, the meaning is, oh, Lord, come, as in come again, we're asking you to come. And so while I do think the Maranatha cry speaks to a future expectation of the Lord's return, you know what? It doesn't hurt to affirm the fact that he has already come. So that doesn't hurt to recognize we can apply a principle there, right? Because he has come and he will come again. So I think both are useful, although like I said, I do think the context is future. But we can recognize that both are true. The word accursed, notice that this, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. And that word accursed is immediately followed by maranatha. Now, it's translated from the Greek anathema. So if we read it like this, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is anathema, maranatha. You see what Paul is doing here, right? He's doing kind of a play on words. Maranatha sounds like a curse, but it has a very different meaning, right? If anyone doesn't love the Lord, that person's going to be cut off. They're a curse. They're cut off from God. But on the other hand, we who do love the Lord should be crying out for him to return. So it creates this great contrast by these two words that sound the same. Not loving the Lord means you're accursed and that you certainly don't long for his return. If you don't love the Lord, you definitely don't want Jesus to return. Loving the Lord Jesus includes yearning for his return. Again, a stark contrast. 
2 Timothy 4, 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award for me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now there are two judgment seats that Jesus will sit in as judge. One is the great white throne judgment, where if you aren't covered in the blood of Jesus, he will judge you based on your actions and your sin. And he will determine your salvation based on that. Believe me, you don't want to go to that judgment. Because if you are judged on whether you're good enough based on your own deeds and lack of sin to have salvation, you're not going to make it. And in fact, no one does. So that's one judgment. Then there's another judgment seat for those people who love Jesus. And it's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And it's sort of like an awards judgment at an ancient Olympic Games. And it uses a word much like that. And so at this judgment... You're judged based on how you serve the Lord in your life. And various awards may be given out at this judgment seat. And they have eternal consequences for your place in the kingdom and your place with the Lord forever. Now, just for your own comfort, we know from 1 Corinthians 3 that let's say at this judgment seat, let's just say you don't do well, okay? So let's say you didn't do anything for the Lord. You have nothing to show for yourself. Paul says, nevertheless, if you're at that judgment seat and you've been saved, you're still saved, but you've got nothing to show for yourself. That's not good. You want to have something to honor your king with and go, because you saved me, I was able to do this in my life. And you want to be able to show him something at this award seat judgment. Because by getting these awards, it's actually a way to honor Jesus and say, thank you for what you've given me. Now let me worship you by admitting that I could have only done these things because you saved me. That's where we get the whole casting crowns from, right from the elders. I'm casting my crown back at you. You gave me a crown because I did something, but I recognize I only did it because you empowered me. And you want to be able to have a crown to cast at his feet, right? It's a great way to worship him. And there's one you can get, one of these crowns, because there's several that are mentioned in the New Testament. Explicitly, there's five. There may be more. But one of them is this crown of righteousness. And you know how you get this one? Because some are kind of hard to get. You know how you get this one? You're excited about the second coming. You long to see Jesus return. And if you truly long to see the second coming of Jesus, you're promised this crown of righteousness. So some of these other crowns I read and I go, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'll tell you what. I've known some old, older ladies who have served in the church. Some younger people too who secretly serve the church in ways that other people don't know about. They sacrificially give of themselves, and they're not recognized in the church for it. And I notice them because of the position I've been in. And they don't want to be recognized at the pulpit for the work they're doing for the church. They don't want to be recognized for maybe how much they've given, and they've sacrificially given of their finances to keep churches alive. And I just think to myself, they're going to kill me at the BMC judgment. They're going to absolutely kill me. There's some of these older ladies I see. I've seen serving in kitchens at certain churches. I'm going to, they're going to absolutely crush me at the judgment seat of Christ because they've done so many great humble things for the Lord only to honor him. But I've always thought, well, at least I get that crown of righteousness. That seems like an easy one. I just have to long for his return. And then I get, at least I have some, at least I got one crown. And then I have to be honest with myself. Wait a minute. Do I really desire the second coming like I should? Am I longing for his return as I should? Maybe not always, to be honest with you. I think sometimes I get distracted by the world. I get distracted by my own concerns day to day. And I take my eye off his return. And so I really need, just need to ask myself, will I earn this crown? And I think all of us should ask ourselves that. And let's... let's um, if, if we're worried about it, let's try to renew our love and, and be excited about the return of Jesus. And if we don't have that feeling in ourselves, we should pray to have that feeling within ourselves. Now let's look at Romans 8, 18 through 22. And, and I know I'm going through several passages, but I'm just looking at a more of a survey on this topic this morning. And this is Romans 8, 18 through 22. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Now you'll notice that nature, creation itself, is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What exactly does this mean? Well, in short, the idea is that when Jesus returns and he has all of his redeemed people with him on earth, he will begin to regenerate creation during his reign. He will start to bring peace and life and eradicate death. And that's why during the reign of Christ on earth, the earth gets better and better and better, and life is brought to it. And creation is restored, leading into the eternal state when it's fully restored. And there's a sense in which creation itself longs for this. That's, creation is this, nature, it's natural order, it's animals, plants, and life. And you know what happens to those things now, to animals, plants, and life? They get sick and die, don't they? They get weakened and die. But this wasn't always so. Only after Adam sinned did death enter into the world. But when Jesus returns, revealing the sons of God, the creation will return to Eden only better. There will be no more disease and death. Creation itself, then, in that way, yearns for the return of Jesus. Because as things die, there's this sense of which all of these things desire life. There's, there's an effort for living things to live, is there not? Living things try to live. So their desire to overcome death. And so in that sense, creation itself yearns for the return of Jesus. All of creation cries for the return of our king. Shouldn't we then, who are more than just plants and animals, shouldn't we as his people who are made in his image and have his Holy Spirit within us, desire his return. We should certainly desire it more than creation. Let's conclude by taking a last look at Revelation twenty-two seventeen and verse 20 again. This is Revelation twenty-two seventeen. The spirit and the bride say come, and let the one who hears say come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. The Spirit says come, that's the Holy Spirit. We who are the bride say come. And he's in us, right? That's the Holy Spirit's desire, should be our desire. Those who hear these words and the gospel may then respond to the Holy Spirit saying come by also saying come. May those who are thirsty for the waters of life say come. That which comes from Jesus, it's what he gives us through his word, through knowledge of him, connection to him, life that flows from him. Revelation twenty two twenty again. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Jesus said that he is coming. You know what? That means that he will come. It will happen because he said he would. Nothing can prevent what Jesus has promised. But in response, we shouldn't just accept that it's true. We should respond as a bride would by saying, even so, even though I know you're coming, I'm asking you to come because I want you to come. We know that he's coming, but yet we should still ask. And that's the Maranatha cry, to cry out with a desire Oh, Lord, come. Oh, Lord Jesus, come now. Please return. Let's reclaim that cry. Let's reclaim it in our lives because it will help us now. It will help us in our relationship with Jesus right now. It will help you in your faith if you desire for Jesus to return. It'll help you overcome sin more in your life. It'll help you be more obedient. This isn't in the sermon, but I want to bring up a point of history. There's a church historian. His name is Philip Schaaf. And he's a post-millennialist. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's not important. It doesn't even matter. 
It's just bad theology. But he recognized that the early church believed that Jesus would return, set up a kingdom on earth, and he would crush evil and he would reign in righteousness. And he admits, because he's an honest historian, despite he disagreed with their theology, he admits, he writes in his, one of his history books, he says, we, we have to admit that the early church's um, expectation that Jesus would return and set up a kingdom motivated early Christians to spread the gospel. Yes, if you believe Jesus is coming, and you don't know when, and he's going to come back and restore this earth, and you are certain in this, and you really believe it, it motivates your life in the present. Because I'm looking forward to some this great end, and I'm only here for this brief moment. Whether Jesus returns in my life or not, or I'm able to make it to the age of 130, which is what I'm, I'm guessing I'll live to. <laughs> Either way, I'm here for a brief moment, so in this time, I want to... I want to serve him because I really believe that this will happen. So it motivates me now. If I didn't really believe it, eh, maybe I'll just take it easy. If I thought maybe it'll happen, but because I'm confident it'll happen, that the Lord Jesus is returning, that he is going to rule in righteousness, and he's going to rule as a great and mighty king, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron over those who don't like him and don't want to obey. But for those who love him, he will rule as a gentle shepherd. And so... You know, practically speaking, I want to be on his good side, so I want to serve him now. It motivates me to spread the gospel. I want people to love him and know him, and I want them to cry out for him to return. So let's reclaim that cry in our lives and as the church. That cry, even so, come Lord Jesus Christ. Maranatha. Let's pray. Abba, Father, blessed be your name, Lord king of the universe and blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord your son jesus christ thank you for sending your son into the world to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again to new life as a first fruits for all of your saints lord jesus we have faith that you are indeed coming back even so we ask you to return maranatha O come lord jesus Return to the place where you, have, where you have established your name forever. Return and set up your throne in Jerusalem. Restore creation and wipe away every tear from our eyes. Return for and to your bride. She has been so patiently waiting for you, Lord. And until that great day of your arrival, direct the Holy Spirit to transform each of us. Allow our faith and excitement in your coming to animate us to serve you now spreading your gospel, and making disciples. It's in these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.